But I'm very happy that our first keynote speaker has examined this buzz uh, around generated about the development of ChatGPT and the implications of that. He has done a survey, uh, 22 if I'm not mistaken. Um, he raised the question in, in higher education, how do we tackle this? And furthermore, he didn't limit his exploration to uh, the findings of this kind of statistically data. Now he wanted to uh, use and develop tools to give us uh, the, the right instruments to tackle what we have for our future. Um, he will be sharing the outcome, but he will also give us insight in what we can achieve using that technology. So he holds a doctoral degree in science. He's a research associate at Harvard University. And more nearby, Université de Namur, he's always, uh, he is also a lecturer at that university. So I'm very, very pleased he can join us today uh, for, to kickstart kick this discussion. Please welcome Michael Lobe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, thank you very much Mark. Or, and thank you to all the organization, or maybe I should say the, the zookeeper. Uh, I, I'm a particular beast in that uh, zoo because I'm a physicist uh, at the beginning, but today I, I'm trying to uh, give you some uh, insight about the impact of generative AI on teaching and on education. And um, you probably all remember uh, around December 22 or uh, January 23 where we saw that tsunami coming with generative AI. The first one being ChatGPT, and we were all like, what should we do with that? There is a tsunami co coming, but we don't know the, the height of the wave. But then other solution came, the Google answer with Bard, Bing with Microsoft, uh, Cloud, Dali, probably you should know that also, and Midjourney. So, at the very beginning, we were all like, okay, maybe there is a panic in academia. And, and the question was really, how should we react to that, right? What would be the reaction in front of that tsunami which is coming and which might change our education system? And so some reactions were like uh, Sciences Po at Paris. The, the first reaction by the end of uh, January just before the second semester started. They said, we ban the use of ChatGPT, right? So that was a reaction to the threat. Um, and quite soon, the question came, how can we control those AI tools? Uh, and then a really clever student from Princeton uh, in, the, in the December 23, 22, sorry, uh, de developed this uh, GPT-0. So it was claimed to be uh, a chat GPT killer and you could provide any text and they will tell you either or not it would be generated by, uh, by AI. So that would be a way to control the threat. Okay, we can think that's maybe a normal reaction and I would like to uh, you, for you to remember what was your first intuition when Wikipedia came along about 20 years ago. Uh, I do remember I was a student and the teacher was telling us you should not rely on Wikipedia, right? And probably now that your mind is, you, you probably evolved a bit about the use of Wikipedia. And if you go along in history, you probably had the same with internet, with Google, Google Translate, Google Deep, all, all, all those, those tools that we are using today. The next one, I really like this picture, where you see some math teacher protect, uh, protesting against the use of calculator, or, right? It was like, okay, students won't be able to do simple calculus anymore. And even more shocking, when I was discussing with one, one of my colleagues, it reminded me that at the very beginning, schools were really against using books when uh, we invented the, the printers for printing books because they were saying that we could uh, propagate fake news and that we won't be able to copy uh, the, 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 the right words or the right science, right? So it has been around for a long time, forbidding uh, all those tools. So I think in that sense, it's a normal reaction. But uh, is it a good idea to use those detectors? Well, probably you know that I will answer no, 
but uh, I, I would like to give you some uh, hints why I, I consider it might be not a not so good idea, and it's based on uh, a paper which was published recently. Actually, what they did in that in that uh, survey is that they used several detectors, like the one I, I presented to you, and they uh, provided a couple of essays. And those essays were judged to see if it was human written or AI generated. And here the graph shows the percentage of all the, how those detectors react and how much are misclassified as uh, AI generated. And what is interesting to, to see is that there is a huge difference uh, between non-native English speakers and native English speakers. For native English speakers, uh, there is between zero to 12% of misclassification. But for non-native uh, English speakers, as we probably, most of us are, uh, there is a 40 to 75% chance. So it's better to flip a coin, right? So false positive can happen. And so that would be a, a first message. We have to be extremely careful with these detectors. A second reason or a second no that I would provide you is uh, probably, okay, let's say that you wanna use it and we say we use it, we ban, we forbid uh, the use of uh, AI tools, generative AI tools, uh, and we say to the students, we have detectors. Okay, but then here comes the solution. Some people are developing stealth GPT and it, it's, it really says that it would be undetectable, right? So that means that your students might use that. And of course, it comes at a cost. There are some pricing there. So that means that your students might buy for some solution. You can say it's a tool, but they will find a way to uh, go over the rule that you said. And so, yeah, if your student is rich enough, probably he will be able to use this kind of, of tool. So according to me, that's not uh, a good way to do it. That's, uh, uh, you will keep playing the police and the burglar all the time. And uh, I would say that we should be really careful with the detector. So my, my, my idea is rather to say, okay, we are facing a tsunami, let's surf on the wave. And uh, it's definitely a new challenge, but any new challenge also brings new opportunities. And we probably have to develop new skills. We are trying to develop them uh, on our own, but those skills will be more than certainly uh, also useful for a new job market. Uh, there, in a couple of years, people will have to uh, make the good prompts uh, and have uh, those new skills. So, it's certainly a new opportunity for teaching, for education, education and we should uh, try to find a new approach for teaching. So that would be the, the outline of my talk. Here I would like to present you a little bit about the impact of uh, AI on teaching and education, uh, present it basically as a tool. There are tools that we should use but they also come with risk. I would like to present a little bit the risk that we should be aware of. I would like to provide you some advice and especially some examples. How can I use AI tools for teaching, uh, either for me as a teacher or uh, use it with my students in my classrooms? And then I will give you some, uh, some insight about what I tried in my class, what was successful and what was not, and uh, discuss about that. So, okay, uh, it, it started uh, in January. I was discussing with colleagues and uh, one of my professor, Marc Romainville, told us that it's a great opportunity to change our evaluation methods. Uh, and I, I believe that it's quite true that we could go away from simple restitution to go to a higher level um, um, of knowledge and uh, of uh, education. So another discussion that I had with my uh, mentor, Eric Mazur, uh, we were really discussing uh, how should we use those tools to design new class activities. And uh, the question that should guide us when we want to design 
uh, a new class activity could be, okay, what can my student do that generative AI can't? And uh, f with that question in mind, we can start designing or uh, changing and adapting uh, our learning goals. And here I put learning goals and evaluation methods uh, in, in, in color because I would like to put that in a bigger, in, in a bigger scheme, in a bigger figure. If you think about the constructive alignment that was proposed by Biggs about 20 years ago, which says that, okay, you first have to think about what are the learning outcomes, what are the skills that you want your students to, to learn in, in your lecture, and then you have to align that with your uh, teaching and learning activities, what you will do with your students for them to develop uh, those new skills, and then uh, align it with uh, the evaluation, the assessment, the exam, the homework, or whatever you want to propose. And actually, if we have new skills, we should probably come with new activities and new ways to evaluate, and that's what I want to speak about today. So um, let me give an example. Uh, one simple example could be, okay, if you say basically, write me a summary of that book, well, that's not gonna work anymore, right? So you should probably ask it in, in a new way and say, okay, ask ChatGPT to write a summary of the book and then double check what he's saying, check the veracity of it. Or another way of doing it, and that's, uh, that has been tried by some of my colleagues at Unamur, it says that, okay, here is the summary. What would be yours? What would, be, what would you add? What would you retrieve? What would you change? And discuss that. So that, that's another starting point um, for, the, for the, the stuff we were doing before. Uh, so, okay, we have a new tool here. Uh, but we should probably learn how to use the tool and uh, make our students learn how to use it properly. We should be aware that there are some li limits, some, uh, some limitations, some risk to use it, and uh, we should definitely show to our students how to use it properly uh, so that they can gain a better understanding uh, of the tool and of uh, the, the, the subject that you are teaching and uh, try to really learn in a critical way, uh, try to develop critical thinking. So um, I would like to take an analogy for, for that. And uh, if you think about the, the use of a jigsaw, uh, well, if you don't know how to use it, if uh, I was given a, a jigsaw, I would be simply cutting woods. And for students, we can compare that to simply cheating, right? But if you are trained to do it properly, then you can probably make art of, out of it. And for the students, it would mean to have higher skills, uh, higher skills in, the, in, in uh, Bloom taxonomy, if I may refer to that. And, uh, but of course, if you cannot use a tool properly, you can have an accident. So I would like to highlight some risk uh, and, and give you some advice not to have any accidents using uh, AI tool. So uh, the, the, the risk uh, I, I'm speaking about were discussed in, the, in, the, in that paper that I really uh, recommend the reading. Uh, it, it's, it's a really good paper where the, the authors discuss about a different, a different approach. Uh, they, they, they tell you about seven different approach, or you can use uh, AI uh, as a tool, and they provide a prompt, and uh, they have a really well structured way to, uh, to uh, write the prompt. Uh, so I think it's really helpful. Uh, they, they use it uh, to be AI as a mentor, as a coach, as a tutor, uh, and so on. So it's really nice uh, read. But uh, the, the risks that they are discussing about, are, there are four of them. Uh, the first one is confabulation risk. You probably heard about that because all those large language models, right, uh, all those AI tools are really, and you probably tried it, uh, they are prone to produce incorrect but plausible, plausible facts. So we are speaking about fake news, facts. Definitely we should be aware and make our students aware that uh, there are some kind of uh, hallucination. So uh, yeah, the, the, the place where we found the most inaccuracies are certainly the source, the citation, the quotes. There are some uh, AI tools like site.ai 
which helps you to give a, a better um, a better view of source and a better quality of source and so on. But uh, I think stuff are still improving, and I really believe that it's like Wikipedia in the old days that it was not really certain, and I really hope that it will be better uh, with time. But that could be pretty hard to uh, to detect unless you are a specialist. Um, there are definitely some bias risk, and those can be quite subtle to, to spot, but uh, it really comes from the way we use AI. So basically, if you think about AI, it's a, it's a lot of data, right? You need a lot of data to train your model. Um, and, and in addition of that, there are some humans which are coming uh, by to uh, put some guidelines, I would say, and um, from those two, training, both the machine one and the human one, some bias can come into the game. And that could be problematic. It could be gender or racial uh, bias. Uh, it could be uh, strong viewpoints, maybe some political opinions. Uh, okay, what is an objective training? I don't know, right? We are all biased in some sense when we are teaching. Uh, I'm definitely biased when I'm also giving this talk. But we should be aware that there are some bias uh, also in, in, those, uh, in those tools. Another risk is definitely the privacy risk. Uh, you all know that when it's free, you are the product, right? So th that means that your data will be uh, used for uh, developing the algorithm, for training the algorithm, and it's not always clear uh, what comes, uh, uh, the, what is the state of the, the privacy. So one general rule is that do not provide any data which are really sensitive to your organization to uh, that private company. Uh, and I think it's also good to warn students uh, about that uh, because some of them might not be comfortable with that. Uh, and there are what they call instructional risk. And uh, it, it comes to the fact that it's a kind of a, a human language, right? You are discussing with a machine, uh, but they can be very convincing. And they have their viewpoints, what they believe would be correct, but sometimes it's not. And uh, so that could convince a students in the wrong way or give an, another um, theory or an alternative theory that you don't want to, to teach. And so if the students do not have critical thinking, if they do not reflect really critically about the answer, or if they don't know uh, about what could be f uh, fake news, uh, that could be uh, quite uh, wrong. And so that could be another risk. Okay, we know that those risks are there. We, uh, it's up to anybody to decide if you take the risk or not. Um, I would like to share with you some advice especially when you are writing something with AI. Uh, that's, that's a paper that I really like from uh, SES Nano. I told you I'm a physicist. Uh, but uh, so the board of editors really uh, gave some advice about the best practice uh, when you are writing a manuscript. And uh, they provide six advice that I already applied for writing. Uh, I wrote a master thesis in education a couple of months ago, and uh, the jury really appreciate uh, that I was using part of this, this advice. Uh, and I think it's quite transparent. The first one is to say, okay, just if you use uh, uh, any AI tool like ChatGPT or BARD or whatever, uh, you should acknowledge it, state it. Say it in the uh, acknowledgement or experimental session, materials and methods or whatever, and clearly say which part you used, uh, which part of your text were generated with uh, the, the tool. And even go further, and I think for full transparency that's pretty good, you should provide the prompts, and you should provide the question and the transcript in the supplementary information so that the reader can really see what was generated by the AI. Um, it could be like you know an interview that you are doing and it, it's part of your data. So that's the, the first advice. The second one uh, is to really to remind that what comes out, the outcome of the AI is a draft. At best, it's a good draft, but you should always uh, think that it, might, it must be incomplete or incorrect. 
that uh, you should uh, really consider, think about every sentence that was uh, suggested. So the main message there is check, 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 and check again. And when you are done, you check again. And uh, I think that's a good thing to keep in mind and that the students should also have in mind. The third one, I think it's also an important one, is that we should not use uh, text verbatim. We should not make copy and paste of what is uh, provided there. Because it's not all words. It, it, we did not write that. And, and so the, what is really important is that, okay, uh, we, we want to avoid inadvertent plagiarism, right? It, it might use a, a text written by someone else and then you copy paste and it's not your, er, your own word and so you, 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 you will do plagiarism. So I think that's an important message. Uh, we, we already said that, but here they, they also recommend to uh, double check the citation. Uh, we already mentioned that. Um, we should not include ChatGPT or Bard as a co-author. It might seem obvious, but there, there was a question a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, we do not uh, cite or put Word or Google Translate as a co-author, right? So. Uh, there is no exception for uh, ChatGPT. It's a tool, it's merely a tool. And the final one is reach to remember that you are the responsible of what is being written, right? So the AI cannot be held responsible for any trouble that might uh, be there. And so I think if we have those we know the risk that I uh, showed you. We have some advice how to, to use it. Then, okay, now we know, okay, we, we had a look at what could go wrong and uh, uh, be careful with using the tool. But now let's try to make hard, uh, not probably the same way as you are doing, but uh, in my way it could be hard uh, with teaching. Um, so the next part of my talk would be about giving you some uh, ideas about how we can use it in our classroom and how it could be a, a tool for us as teachers, but also how we can use it with the students. So um, yeah, at the, the very beginning of uh, uh, January, uh, we, were, we were discussing, okay, can we use it uh, and I was on, on ChatGPT and trying stuff, and I was giving a lecture on plasmonics, uh, a topic in, in physics, and I asked, okay, can you provide me with the outline for a lecture in plasmonics? And it gives you a full outline in a couple of seconds with an introduction, uh, principle, conclusion, challenge, and limitation. What if I'm not happy with that one? Okay. You g generate a second one in two seconds. And you have a second one here, uh, which is pretty good. And if you think that it's too draft, you can merge it, and then you have inspiration for creating your own uh, outline. You can go a step further and say, okay, can it design a, a course syllabus? Uh, I have to uh, design it for, for my, my same plasmonic class. And then it gives you a course description, a course objectives. Uh, it, it can provide you the outline, as we said, give you some ideas how to assess uh, for the exams, uh, project words, give you some reference. And that time it was pretty good because those books are the ones I'm using for my class. So that's, that was uh, pretty interesting. Uh, it could be a tool also for helping us designing such a, such a course. Okay, I've built, uh, I've designed a course. Now I want to probably prepare a class activity. Uh, what can I do in class? And here is a tweet that, that uh, I found on, on Twitter, at the time it was still Twitter, um, uh, about uh, how to uh, use it in the classroom. And the, the prompt was, okay, plan three lessons uh, about uh, volcano formation and you specify how you want it. So each lesson needed an introductory activity, some inputs, some student tasks, and a plenary. And off, it gives you what you want instantaneously for the first lesson with the introduction activity, the information input, the task, and the plenary. 
Same for the second les lesson on the type of volcano, same for the third one on the effect of volcano. So once again, it's a draft, but it's, it could be useful for what you are teaching and just generate ideas um, at the, and place where to start. And if you want to say, okay, no, uh, I want that in, in the form of a table, can you tabulate it? Okay, it will generate you uh, the same version uh, as a table. Um, you can also use it to create personalized exercise. Here I tried it for creating uh, an exercise on the plural of names in English, and then it provides you with a list uh, of those, uh, uh, those kind of exercises that you ask. So, of course, I, I, I went a step further, and I, I'm teaching Optics 101 uh, to biology and vet students, and I said, can you generate 10 multiple choice questions on geometrical optics? And I put additional constraints. Five proposition, only one correct one. And here it goes. And of course, you see me coming. That's how I made my exam. That's how I generated question for my exam also. And of course, it can also highlight the correct answer. So uh, <laughs> I had the, the, the 10 correct answer. I double checked and it was right. <laughs> Okay, so what, what else could you do? You could also, you, you are trying to uh, grade a master thesis and you want some criteria, you want to design a rubric, and it can also give you a good draft for doing that with some criteria about the methods, the result, the discussion, and so on, and provide you some grading schemes uh, from excellent to, to poor. So that could be helpful just also, that could be the basis that you can discuss with your colleagues. Um, so, okay, that could help us, I, I would say, when we are at home, when we are uh, just trying to prepare a lecture, but we can also use it with the students, but with the students when they are supervised by the teachers. And so some examples here that uh, I, I will present to you is that, well, Probably the first one, uh, you probably know about that, about all those creativity that uh, those uh, kind of tool can, uh, can have. And I will show you uh, an example of one of my colleagues, Simon Labat from Inamur, and he's teaching to uh, history, uh, historians, art historians, Romanists, and so on. And he's teaching uh, English um, in, a, in an active pedagogy way. And what it tried to do is to uh, have uh, crossovers of different stories, and I will show you some examples, or write derived stories, uh, rewriting stories with different styles. So I'm gonna show you two examples. Um, the, the first one is really funny, it's when uh, Indiana Jones meets uh, Han Solo. And, and so you can see that uh, Indiana Jones uh, found a really uh, extraordinary power, which is a time stone, and so he's able to travel both in time and space, and uh, he, he will meet uh, Han Solo, the, 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 the pilot of the Millennium Falcon, and then the discussion starts between Indiana Jones and Han Solo, and so uh, that could be uh, really interesting for making, uh, generating new ideas uh, in this creative writing. Another one that I really like is that, uh, is the following one saying, tell me the story of Tangled in the style of Donald Trump. And so, uh, yeah, I will read that with you and you have to picture Donald Trump speaking. Okay, folks, let me tell you about the story of Tangled. It's a tremendous movie, a beautiful story, really beautiful. So we have this girl, Rapunzel, we've got this long hair, tremendous hair, the best hair you've ever seen, right? And, and it goes on and on, and uh, I think it's a pretty nice exercise. Um, so definitely we can use it for creative writing, and uh, we can try it to uh, try to compare different writing styles, different uh, writing forms uh, with a, a similar team, so that could be a good tool to try uh, in, in the classroom. Another example that I really like is that we could say that it could be a good study partner at home. You know, have kind of have a personal teaching assistant at home, and um, the, the way we can do it is to say, okay, 
you, you provide some text material to the chatbot and you say, learn that. And you copy some part of your syllabus uh, or you ask to your student to copy some part of your syllabus or a, a website that you really you know and that you trust. And then you ask to the bot to generate some question about that. So that could be a way to generalize personalized exercise for your students at home and they can train uh, about uh, some material that you validate, right? You trust this material. And so that, that could prevent some risk that we have seen uh, before. So here is the, an example about 10 questions about uh, uh, introduction to psychology, but it could be uh, whatever you, you want. Another thing uh, those kind of uh, software are good at is uh, coding, or good, it depends. It also has bugs. Uh, but some of my programmer friends told me that it saved them about 50% of the time, so which is uh, quite good. And it can provide code. So here it's, uh, uh, they, they ask a computer game in tic-tac-toe in Python. Uh, so uh, the, the code is, uh, is provided. It can debug or it can explain what the code is doing. So that could be a way to use the tool. You provide a code and you say to your student, okay, try to explain the code using uh, the AI tool. Or you can insert mistakes in your code or ask to code it with mistakes and then ask to debug with the, um, the software. And, and so by comparing, trying to find the mistakes, the students will learn also how to, to code properly. So that would be another way also to shifting a bit our minds about our usual way of uh, uh, teaching. Um, another example that I, I like is to say it's simply a writing assistant. And probably, uh, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that in, uh, in the coming future we will have this kind of tool inserted in Microsoft uh, Word or, or stuff like that. Uh, but uh, so it can proof, proofread text and uh, you should probably say, okay, uh, maybe I find uh, I have a better prompt than this one, but uh, suggest uh, grammar and statistic uh, corrections, uh, and we can use it in our daily life, right? If we want to write an email or a grant proposal or uh, review a paper or, or, or whatever, but uh, the students can also use that to uh, find mistakes and really improve the writing size. So if we use it as a tool, as a, a writing assistant. Okay, so I tried, uh, I, I, I was really enthusiastic in January when I found all those examples. Uh, I said, okay, let's try it in my, in my class. Um, how can I design my uh, class activity for my uh, first bachelor when I'm giving Optic 101 a bit more than yeah, 250, 300 students uh, in, in biology and veterinary science? And I was thinking, okay, what can I do uh, with AI? What would be my goals? My goals would be to say, okay, let's try to initiate to AI tools and discover a new approach of teaching uh, to learn something. In my case, it was optics using the tools and develop the critical thinking. So I was really enthusiastic. I was discussing about all those wave and those, those uh, new tools that were coming. We were in February. Um, and I told my students, okay, let's try to do this exercise. Uh, at the end of each chapter, I will suggest you that you do a small exercise using ChatGPT. We will use it first to summarize the, the chapter one, then to give examples, to provide some suggestion for experiments about uh, geometrical optics, for example, to define some concept of quantum optics, or to solve some exercise. Um, and when I told that to my students, so they were a bit like, yeah, 250, 300, and, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, what I had in the back of my mind was Bloom's taxonomy. So all the, those different levels, uh, uh, going from the, the most uh, easy one to the, like, understanding to just to more creative uh, uh, stuff. So that, that was what uh, was in the back of my mind, but I didn't tell them. Um, and how the, so after the, the first lecture, 100, and 100 students said uh, on MOOC Lab that they would be interested to, to follow such kind of uh, exercise. So I was pretty happy, so I said, okay, let's organize a meeting next week. 
And at the meeting next week, 25 students came out. And when they had to sign and say, yes, I will do it, only six students registered. So in that sense, it was kind of a failure. Um, only six students from the 300 students, I was like a bit disappointed. Uh, I did the experiment with them. I had qualitative data, but not quantitative. Uh, and I was thinking, well, why did it fail? Um, and I, I'm going to yeah, share with you the, the reason uh, why I think it's, it failed, so that you can uh, prevent uh, having the same pitfalls as what I did. Uh, first of all, it was first bachelor. So I think we all know what first bachelor is. They still discovering university, trying to find if they are on the good path. So okay, that's uh, that explains why a part of it uh, are, are not interested into that. But then I also realized that uh, what I was telling them, I was hoping that they will do it just for the fun uh, of learning a new tool. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> probably I was wrong, right? I had no points at the exam, no bonus. And if I come back to my constructive alignment, actually I was breaking that deal, that equilibrium. I was asking them to, have, to learn new skills, have more, uh, and learn new, uh, have more teaching activities, but nothing uh, on the assessment and the evaluation. So it was not, in, in full equilibrium, so that didn't work, I think, also for that, and I have to come back to the, the basics next year when I would like to re-implement that and probably uh, rebalance everything. But then there was another hidden assumption to me, and actually I was not aware of that one, but actually student does not know AI. And that was a shock for me, uh, but most of my students really don't know about AI. And how can I prove that? Actually, some of my colleagues, uh, and it's actually my sister, who, uh, who uh, did the study uh, at UNAMUR, and they did this survey about a bit more than uh, 1,200 1, students from first bachelor. And so they were really first bachelor from all uh, uh, faculties, uh, medicine, law, economics, everything, all the six faculties we have uh, in Namur. And they did that for the survey for about a month, uh, and it was an anonymous survey. And what did they ask to the, to the students? They asked, okay, do you use AI for your, for your lectures, for your course? Uh, how do you use it, and uh, which kind of tool do you use? And here are the results. 69%, sorry, percent of the, the students are using Google Translate, as we, most of us uh, are doing, and 39% uh, and are using DeepL. So those are the two tools I was already mentioning, right, that now looks more accepted than, than before. 30% use Google search image, but for ChatGPT, it's only 13%. And that was a, sh a shock for us. Only 13%. I was sure that all the students were using ChatGPT, but no, that was a misconception that I had in my mind. Uh, they, only 13% were using it. Probably this number is increasing, but uh, still it's, it's a rather low percentage. And actually, that number was backed up by another study in the US, where uh, in this Pew uh, re uh, research survey, saying that 14% of US adults use it to learn something uh, or for their own work. So that was a shock. And I have to think that out of six students, five doesn't know about AI. The five did not use ChatGPT. So I have to come back to, to that and uh, the, we must teach them how to use the tool uh, properly. So that, that would be a, a message. Um, if they are, and so the, the study goes on, and uh, they were also asking, if you are using ChatGPT, why do you use it? And the answer were actually pretty similar to what I, I suggested uh, as an experience before, but uh, defining a concept, understanding a part of the lecture, illustration purpose, and also solving exercise for 35%. 
Um, so I was like, okay, I was a bit disappointing with this first experiment, but I said, okay, let's try to, to do a second one. And uh, so they are using it for solving exercise. Um, I was suggesting uh, those kind of stuff in the first experiment. Uh, so I said, okay, let's focus on uh, develop critical thinking and uh, solving exercise. And so I, I, we, we did a second experiment in the class and uh, we said, okay, uh, so they have exercise session. Uh, they are trying to solve exercise for two hours with a teaching assistant in reduced group, about 25 students. And uh, I asked them to prepare the, ex the last exercise session uh, on undulatory optics uh, with ChatGPT. So I, they had the, the, the exercise and they had to put it in ChatGPT and see what was coming out. And in the syllabus, they also had the numerical answer. So they could compare what was, uh, what was saying ChatGPT and uh, with the, the correct answer. And what was the aim of the study? Uh, we wanted to kind of measure uh, if they had insight and if they had critical thoughts uh, once they, they had the answer provided by ChatGPT. So really, how do they think about it? And so we did a, an anonymous survey at the end of the, uh, the exercise session. And so uh, I, I would like to share some results with you. We had a, a good number of students who participated, so 192 participants. So that's pretty good. The first question uh, that we ask is, did you solve at least one exercise using ChatGPT? Did you, did you try what I, I, I told you? And actually I got quite mixed results. I got 45% which did not prepare, right? So, uh, and 50% which did prepare. So that's good because I have like, let's say 50, 50, 100, 100 students. So I have a good statistic there. Um, so the second question we were interested, okay, uh, those who didn't do it, why? Why didn't you? Uh, solve uh, and, and try to do the, the exercise. Um, again, 63% said, I don't have enough time. And that's fair enough. We were two weeks before the exams, so it was the really last uh, exercise session. So fair, they have to study for the exam. I do understand that. But 25% of the students said that they were not comfortable with AI. And that's also something that I didn't know. They, they, they are not trained to that. Um, and 22%, and uh, let's say one, one student out of five, they don't see their interest. Why is Professor Lobet doing that? I don't know, I don't care. Uh, and uh, some of them also, again, extra work, so it comes back to the not enough time uh, in, in the balance, and uh, some people are simply not interested in using that. So it comes back once again to my uh, constructive alignment. I probably next time have to motivate my student, tell them why it would be useful for them to learn that new skill, that why it will be useful for them in so their first bachelor or so in, in four years when they will be on the job market, why it's useful for them. And I should also put some time in my uh, lecture to, to do it uh, properly. Okay, uh, the, the last result I'm gonna share with you is, uh, okay, for those who did the, the, the test and uh, how critical they are, what are the thoughts, do they take a step back? And we said, okay, we consider that they have critical thinking if there are two possibilities because, you know, ChatGPT will, if you, I don't know if you tried it, but, uh, I guess you did not do a physics exercise, but it, 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 about 50% of the case it gives you a right answer or it gives you a wrong answer. So uh, the answer could be either correct or incorrect. And uh, if the student check the, the final answer that is correct and they go through the reasoning, uh, we said that they, they are uh, critical. Uh, and if it's the, the, the answer provided by ChatGPT is incorrect, if they go through the calculation and try to spot the mistakes, we also think that they are uh, uh, having a critical uh, thinking. 
And we found out that 60% of our students, so from those, the, the, the part who did the exercise, 60% of the students have uh, cr critical thinking. That's good, that's a good number, that's about 50, but definitely that's not 100. So probably there is also room for improvement there and we should probably keep going and uh, that was a first test, but we should probably have uh, extra exercise with them uh, for, for that they, they develop their critical thinking. Okay, let me wrap up uh, now. Um, so I think that we were all faced with this kind of tsunami. It was kind of a threat. Um, I, I prefer to see it as an opportunity for teaching. I try to provide you with some examples uh, how we can use it in the, in the classrooms. I, I showed you that there were some risks, um, but uh, definitely we should be aware of everything uh, and we should explore it. And uh, by exploring it, I think we should develop a critical curiosity. And by critical curiosity, I think that uh, we should have a combination of uh, curiosity, expertise, and systematic investigation. I really think that the field is missing now uh, and we are trying to do it, but uh, I encourage everybody to do it. We, we need really um, a systematic and scientific investigation on this big question on how AI will impact education and te teaching. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Very interesting. Um, we maybe don't have time for any questions, but well, I'll try anyway. Uh, as, as you all know, uh, Michael is going to be around for a, a, a while, so during coffee break you can ask questions, but if you have any now at this time, it would be a good uh, idea. Yes, let me run up. Hello, uh, this is Pia Tikka, Baltic Film and Media School. So uh, I was just curious about all your examples. Uh, I can see the benefits of it and, and, and the dangers of it, but I was wondering how much have you encountered or exper experienced with uh, writing uh, blind reviews on, on articles or chapters that maybe have been sent to you? So y y your question, if I got it properly, is that uh, how many um, did, did I use it as a, uh, did I receive some generated text uh, which were generated by AI that I couldn't spot? Basically? Yes, uh, this way or the other way around. I'm, I'm just curious about, about uh, like review processes in, in uh, scientific uh, domains and uh, journals, etc. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how much uh, uh, these tools are already used for uh, reviewing because you can use them for reviewing a student paper, so. Um, I don't know, actually what I, uh, I, I don't know how much, so when I'm reviewing papers, uh, I hope uh, that they will follow the SES uh, nano guidelines. If, if There are two ways, right? Either for reviewing my own paper or for, do you mean reviewing our own paper or for reviewing the paper from someone else? Because I mean scientific papers uh, in general. Like, in general, uh, yeah. Having because chat GPT uh, write the review instead of yourself. Uh, right, right, right. It. I, I, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, when I say you, I mean like English kind of generally, right. uh, okay. per any, any person. I really <laughs> hope that people are not uh, doing it, right? <laughs> because otherwise, uh, I would see directly how wrong it could be, right? Um, I, I know that there are also some tools now that uh, that might be really helpful. Uh, th there are uh, plenty of tools for uh, scientific literature and uh, they, they said that you can have a, a pretty good summary. I didn't try it, but uh, I, I know that you can have a pretty good summary of a paper and, and so on. I hope people are not doing that for peer review, otherwise it will kill peer review, I, I believe. Uh, so I would not recommend people doing it. Um, is there a way to control? I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure. Uh, okay, I, I'm telling my student, when we are writing a paper, uh, use it as a writing assistant just to rephrase or enhance the style or correct the style. And I think that's quite okay when we are using Google Translate or stuff like that. But when you are in the other side, as a reviewer, I would 
really not recommend to you this. Yeah, I think we will need a breakout session called a coffee break later on to discuss this further. A second and last question maybe, I'm very sorry, we had pressed for time. Otherwise, this breakout session called coffee is gonna be after the next speaker. Okay, thank you so much, Michael. It was uh, a pleasure. Let's <laughs> move.